want to look today at the Holy Spirit in the life of Christ. The Holy Spirit in the life of Christ. Now the word Christ, first of all, you know people talk about, you know, Jesus. They call it Jesus Christ, and this is right. But people have come to think that that word Christ was his last name. Now, I mean, we laugh and we chuckle, but there's a lot of folks out there that actually believe that Christ was Jesus' last name. And it wasn't. It was, matter of fact, he was called Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth being the city that he grew up in. The word Christ is actually a title that's given. He is the Christ of God. Now that's a, a English rendering of a Greek word which is has a Hebrew equivalent of Messiah. And the word Christ comes from a Greek word, Christos. Christos. C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S. -S, Christos. That word Christos takes its root from another word, Creo. Creo. C H R I O. Creo. And the word creo in the Greek means to anoint. Now I said all that to say this. Jesus Christ means literally Jesus the anointed one. Okay? Now. It's important for you to understand this about, first of all, Jesus, and second of all, the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said in Luke 4, matter of fact, we got time. Let's flip over to Luke 4. Off, that Jesus said this about himself. In Luke 4, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth. Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, you need to underline that. Now, y'all know that Jesus is our, what? He's our example. Isn't that right? We're supposed to follow the example of Jesus. And it says right here about Jesus, he had a particular custom. Now, if this was the custom of Jesus, I think it'd be okay to be our custom. Amen. Amen. What was that custom? And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Jesus was in church when the doors were open. Amen. Well, you know, brother, we don't we don't feel like you know we need to be in bondage. I, as a matter of fact, I remember there was a young fellow I was talking to who was going through a difficult time in his life. And if there's any time you need to be in church, it's particularly when you're going through a trial. Amen. Amen. <laughs> this fellow said, well, you know, Brother Donnie, I just made up my mind. Uh, I'm on the inside, I'm thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> Anytime you hear that, man, get ready. He said, I'm just not going to be in bondage to church attendance. But it was Jesus' custom. If it was time for church, Jesus was there whether he felt like being there or not. Whether he thought he needed it or not. Now listen to me. If Jesus, the anointed one, was in church when the doors were open, I think we need to pay attention to that. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. He goes on to say, there was, he stood up for to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, listen to this, he found the place where it was written. Now, he did not go about this thing like this. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Here's what we got. He found the place where it was written. All right? And he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
because he hath anointed me. What did he say he had done to him? Anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Hallelujah. What did he just say? You see, that was a prophecy. It says where he, he found the place where it was written. You know where that place was? I mean, he didn't just make something up. He went to the prophets. He went to the word of God that was already written about him. And in the book of Isaiah, it just told you right And he found where the, the book of the prophet Isaiah He looked that up and he said, Now God has fulfilled this scripture today. In essence, what he was saying was, The Holy Spirit of God has anointed me for the work of the ministry. That's what he was saying. Well, now wait a minute, brother. I mean, after all, Jesus is God. He's second part of the Godhead. God. But during his earthly ministry, he emptied himself of his position or of his, of his godly power. And he took upon himself the form of a man. Now because of that, God had to anoint him. And his whole ministry was based upon reliance of the working and the action and the power and the flow of the Holy Spirit through his life. Now, I want us to hit a couple of other scriptures about, I want to firmly establish the fact that, first of all, Jesus had to be. You hear what I said? He had to be anointed by the Holy Spirit in order to fulfill his earthly ministry. Now, look with me at Acts chapter 4 and verse 27. Now, here we have uh, a prayer action. In verse 24, it shows you that they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, and this is, what they, this is actually a summation of what they said. But in verse 27, it got down to it says, Of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. Thou hast anointed. Jesus had to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now, and of course I've quoted this, numbers of time throughout this conference and undoubtedly it will continue to do so evidently but Acts 10:38, 38 and if you don't remember any of the scriptures when you leave I'll bet you'll remember this one <laughs> how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost now that's how the King James reads but actually on the first lessons that we in this series we talked about the difference in the word spirit and ghost. And if you'll remember, the word, there is no difference. The word ghost is simply an old English term that was commonly used in the days of the King James translators. All right? And they weren't real consistent with a lot of the words that they translated because they translated as one thing here and another thing somewhere else. See? And you'll find where they... Uh, they translated the same Greek word, pneuma, pneuma, as ghost in one instance, and in another instance, they call it spirit. So it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, you could say it this way, with the Holy Spirit 
and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Amen. God who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So, we see that anointing was applied to the life of Jesus during his earthly ministry, and this anointing depicts an anointing for holy service. Primarily, in the case of Jesus, that of high priest. Hallelujah. Go study that sometime. Go study the, the, uh, the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus. You talk about getting blessed. That bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. It'll do some good stuff to you. Now, in, in the heavens, before the incarnation, or before his entrance into planet Earth, Jesus dwelt with the Father as the Word of God. We touched on it last night in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made, uh, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. All right? In verse 14 of John 1. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What is the grace of God? What is the grace of God? It's God's Holy Spirit. It's God's Holy Spirit moving and working and flowing in your life. So, we see, of course, once again from 1 John 5, 7, that before His coming, there were three that bore witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, that Scripture says. So that there were three succinctly separate personalities, beings, but yet they are one in complete unity, agreement, harmony. Hallelujah. They have been so unified and they, have, they think the same thoughts. They have the same goals, the same vision, the same plan, the same purpose. And they all flow and work together to make this thing come to pass. And they've never had an argument or a disagreement about anything throughout the ceaseless ages of time. Three separate, yet they are one. Hallelujah. So, we see that Jesus, when he came into the world, clothed himself with humanity. He laid aside all of his glory and his power as the pre-incarnate Christ, the second part of the Godhead, that he might come to planet Earth and clothe himself, take upon himself the nature and the body of a man. Hallelujah. Now, let's, uh, in doing so, he voided himself willingly. Willingly. That's his voice. That's important. Jesus willingly voided himself that he might as a, the Krios, the Christos, the anointed one, identify with the problems, the hurts, the pains, the sorrows, the temptations, the tests, and the trials that you and me go through every day. Hallelujah. That he would be a faithful high priest and have him identified with what we're dealing with down here. He is able to the utmost to succor or to help those who are being tempted. Now let's look at that in the Word. Turn to, let me find it here, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, and we'll read verses 5 through 8. The word of the Lord says, Let this mind be in you. Now, that tells me right off the bat it's the kind of option. Let this mind be in you. You've got to let the mind of Christ operate in you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who 
being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. If you're equal with God, what's that make you? Okay. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Jesus had to become a man so he could die. And he had to die so that he could be the sacrifice that God required. There was no man, woman, boy, or girl on planet earth who qualified. None of us. We had all been sold into sin. All of our righteousness in our best day was as filthy rags in the presence of Almighty God. God needed a Savior. God needed a pure, spotless, innocent Lamb. And in order for God to do that, He had to provide His own. And He did that through the person of Jesus. And Jesus, in order to become that Lamb, had to empty Himself of his, of his Godhood standing with the Father. And he had to literally become a man. He emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation and became a man. Turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. And in verses 14, 14 through 18. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, that's what I've been telling you, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He became a man. Hallelujah. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his what? What's that word? Say it. Say it. Say it. He's talking about you. Glory to God. <laughs> He's my brother. Jesus is my brother. Glory to God. Mm. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God and to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or to help them that are tempted. He's been there, bless God, that's what he just said. <laughs> Amen. He could not relate to our temptations unless he had tasted of them with the same weaknesses and frailties and limitations that me and you have. He became a man. He became a man. Oh, but you know, the Bible says, you know, brother, that we can lay hands on the sick, and you know, we ought to be doing that. Oh, yeah, but that was Jesus. Let me repeat this. I want you to get this. He became And because he was just a man. But he wasn't really just a man. He was a spotless, innocent man. And you know what kind of blood was coursing through his veins? 
chains. The blood of God. Because the offspring gets his blood from the father. Not the mother. And because Jesus father was God, he took his blood from God. So he was God because his father was God. But he was man because he was born of woman. Perfect God. Perfect man. But because he had become perfect man, although God was his father, he was functioning and operating according to the laws that govern man. Therefore, he had the same limitations that you and me have. Now that is absolutely crucial for you to understand. That's what I'm, the, the, the Spirit of God just keeps hammering, wants to get through to you. During the earthly ministry of Jesus, he was a man. And all the miracles and the signs and the wonders that he performed was only through and because God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. It was actually the Spirit of God flowing through the Word of God as he was yielding himself to that anointing. Now that's what we are here to look at today. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is the element and the agent that enabled Jesus to be successful and to complete the mission. He came here with a mission. He came here with a mission, praise God. He came on a rescue mission. And he also came to search and destroy. He came to search out the works of the devil and to destroy him that had the power of death. Amen. Hallelujah. Guess what? He did. Yes, he, did. he did. But how he did it? He did it through the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Now, the reason I keep harping on that is because the same Holy Spirit that anointed Jesus has been given to you. We, he, he gave us the same tools to use that he used. We got the same hammer. We got the same saw. We got the same level that Jesus used. Same tools. Hallelujah. Well, let's look at this. We see in Luke 1, verse 31, the fact that the birth of the Word of God into human flesh was a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit. What did the angel Gabriel tell Mary? She said, Lord, I just, I'm telling you, man, you're blowing my mind. I, I just don't see how this can be. How can these things be? Hallelujah. What did he tell her? He said, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, shall come upon me. And the power of the highest. God is the highest. The power of the highest. The power of the highest. In other words, the Holy Spirit of God is the power of God. And she would conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit moving and working in her life. And he said, that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So we see that the birth of Jesus came from the power of Almighty God. Actually, the working of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, on the Virgin Mary. Now, well, I will get into that. From the birth of Jesus unto the day of his special anointing for service, we see that the Holy Spirit was working in the life of the Christ child, of Jesus. Look at Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> Pardon me for a second, please. In Luke chapter 2.
2 and verse 40. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. The grace of God was upon him. What did we just say the grace of God was? The Spirit of God working in your life, isn't it? So we see that he waxed strong. That phrase, wax strong, comes from a Greek word, kratio, which means to increase in vigor of the Holy Spirit's action. To increase in vigor of the Holy Spirit's action. So the Spirit of God was seen working even in the childhood of Jesus, causing him to grow in God's grace and wisdom. This was to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 11, verses 2 and 3, in which the coming Messiah would be filled with the spirit of wisdom. Hallelujah. We read that particular prophecy during the first uh, session of this series, if you all will remember. Now, the supernatural anointing for service did not come upon Jesus until his maturity. Now, I did not just contradict what I just said. The Holy Spirit moved upon Mary. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost. During the childhood of Jesus, the Holy Ghost was working in his life, causing him to grow in wisdom and in grace. However, the anointing for service did not come upon him until he was completely matured and had reached the legal age according to Jewish law. There are, the reason I, I say this, there are books out that have been uh, inspired of Satan. And they accuse Jesus of performing all kinds of miracles and signs and wonders even as a little boy. They are lies from the bowels of hell. Stay away from it. They violently and radically contradict the written word of God. Jesus never performed a miracle. until he was set into his earthly ministry at the, at the age of 30 years old. As a matter of fact, the first miracle he did, the marriage of Cana, where he turned water into wine, the Bible specifically says this, beginning of miracles. Amen. I like something I heard Brother E.W. teach a couple of weeks ago. I'm telling you, you know, I'm often read over that and kind of looked at it, you know, I just never stopped to pray through on it. I don't know why, I just never did. Well, Brother E.W. did. <laughs> and I used to wonder, you know, Mary asked him to turn his water into wine, and he told her it's not time yet for my appearing. And he did it anyway. Did that ever cross anybody's mind? Did you ever think that kind of peculiar? <clears throat> Hallelujah. You see, Jesus came to fulfill the law. Is that right or wrong? That's right. Isn't it? He came. He, he had to fulfill the law. And he had to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law. <clears throat> Because if he violated even a little jot of the law, he no longer could be the sacrifice. And you know, in the law, children had to obey their parents. And rebellious children could be carried outside the city and stoned to death. Wouldn't have many kids running around America today. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you wouldn't have stolen, but a few of the rest of them catch on. There's a little kid. 
See, that's why Jesus went ahead and honored that request of his mother. He was fulfilling Jewish law. But his anointing for service and being set out into the ministry had to wait until he was 30 years of age because that also was Jewish law. That also was Jewish law. Children were not considered men until they were 30 years of age. Our kids think they know everything when they're 12. <laughs> Saw a little card at work the other day, and it was to kids. It said, kids, something to the effect that, are you tired of uh, your parents always down on your throat, on your back? Hurry up. Leave home. Get your own place while you still know everything. Amen. Well, it's not that way in the East, even to this day. It's not that way in the East. Children are children, and they respect their parents, and they honor their mother and their father. And God honors that. Matter of fact, that's the first commandment with promise, isn't it? And if we'll honor our mother and our father, whether we understand the reasoning behind it, whether we ever understand the reasoning behind or the logic behind their actions and, you know, the, the things they do, it's really irrelevant. The word says honor, period. Not honor them when you understand why. Honor them. And when you do that, God will honor you. And he will bless you with long life. Hallelujah. I've seen ungodly people. Ungodly people who honored their parents. Who is, bless God, just love mom and dad, just honor them. Pour their life out and just live and live. And I mean, I'm talking about getting get old and gray. Old. Just because they honored mom and dad. You had to work for an unbeliever as well as a will of believer. That's a fact. God will honor that. So we see Jesus was actually fulfilling the law by honoring his mother by doing that first miracle, even though the perfect timing of God to start his ministry had not yet come. And it's important to see that this was the first miracle that he performed in accordance with God's word. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. So we see that that anointing for service did not come upon him until he was launched out into his earthly ministry. And that was the anointing for doing the works of God because we see that the action and working of the Holy Spirit had been dealing with him and working in his life even from his very conception. Amen? So the anointing came upon Jesus after his baptism in the river Jordan by John. Y'all remember he came up there and John said, Man, I have, you got to help me here, Lord. I can't comprehend this. Now what's happening? I need you to baptize me. And you coming to me asking me to baptize you? He said, suffer it to be so now, for, you know, so that we can fulfill all righteousness. And he suffered or he allowed it. And the Bible says that when... Uh, John baptized him. He came up out of the water and what happened? The Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. We'll look at that in a moment. So that is actually when Jesus received the anointing of the Holy Spirit for his service, for his ministry. Okay? Uh, the Holy Spirit, as we just said, revealed himself. In the form of a dove, I'll remind you all in our first lesson, we looked at that. And that depicted the gentle, harmless nature of the Spirit of God. Uh, we talked briefly about the fact that, that the Holy Spirit will never, ever force you beyond your control. And if you get people that jump up and say, I just couldn't help it, God made me do that, they are not under the control of the Holy Spirit. They are lying through their teeth. Whether it's intentional or unintentional, it is a lie because it ain't truth. That's what makes it a lie. It's not truth. And because
because you see the Spirit of God will only flow through you to the degree that you will yield and allow Him. So people have done either one of two things then when they go wild like that. They've either just gotten in themselves and lost self-control or they've yielded themselves over to a demonic spirit. Let me show you something real quick. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God call it Jesus the first, and that no man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So what? It's obvious to me that it's possible in the church to have people come in and stand up and be inspired by a spirit to speak. God made me do that. I couldn't help it. If you couldn't help it, it wasn't God. It wasn't God. And I'll be glad to cast that thing out of you. Amen. Hallelujah. And you need to seriously think about it. You need to seriously think about it. If, if that ever happens to you, there's a problem. There is a problem. Now, I'll tell you this. There are times when the anointing will come upon you. And you will be so yielded to the Spirit of God, you'll be like a puppet. You'll be just like a puppet. But you will never be out of control. I remember ministering in a service to a young lady who had a smoking habit. And she came up to be delivered. The Spirit of the Lord was moving and ministering, and, and the Lord just had me call people. Anybody that had any kind of habit come down here now? This young lady, can't she have a smoking habit? And I was just completely yielded to the Spirit of the Lord. And all of a sudden, she stood in front of me. It was like I was watching a movie, almost. I, it's the best way I can describe it. I saw myself step backwards, and I saw my finger go up. And I heard myself say, like somebody took a baseball bat and busted her in the stomach. And immediately she was knocked over this way and began to wretch out a spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit did not force me to do that. I was aware of what was happening the whole I was thinking, boy, isn't this neat, while I was watching this operation of the Spirit of God through me. And at any point in time, I could have stopped it. I didn't want to. That's the difference. All right? Now, people that just swear up and down, they had no control, rest assured, that is not I don't care how good it looks or smells or how religious it looks. It ain't God. Okay? Now, we see this anointing came into Jesus. And it's interesting to note in the wilderness temptation that the Bible says the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness. Isn't that right? So he led Jesus into, you know, the Spirit of God will lead you into some dry places. Lord, I just don't understand. Man, I just feel like I'm in the middle of the desert. This couldn't be you. How the devil do this to me? Devil, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Get behind me. And all the time it was the Spirit of God that led you out there. If he led Jesus 
is out there, you rest assured he's going to take you and me to the death. Amen. Amen. Why? There are some things that can only be developed inside your character and life out in the desert. So, if you... I bet I'll tell you that you quit praying in tongues. <laughs> you know, the Bible says that when you pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit over Romans 8 says for some time we don't know what we ought to be praying for. So the Spirit Himself helpeth our infirmities. And He intercedes through us with groanings that, that can't be uttered or understood or, or, or with the mental uh, faculties be articulated or understood. In other words, He is praying, we are praying, He is giving us the utterance on the inside and we begin to release that utterance as we pray in tongues. Now it also goes on to say, that the Holy Spirit is praying in accordance with what? The perfect will of God. Y'all beginning to see where I'm going? God has a, a perfect will for your life. And then there is a permissible will. He'll let you do things. And then there's a good will. And you'll see the good will will get you about a 30-fold measure of the anointing and blessings of God and the permissive will to get you on up into about a 60-fold realm. But if you want the 100-fold realm of the anointing and the blessings and the power of God and the abilities of Jesus, you've got to want the perfect will of God. And how many of you know that none of us, none of us as human beings have reached perfection? Okay? How many of you know that there's only some things have to be burned out of you. And there's only one way to do it. And in order to get your skin tough, you know, and I used to do uh, karate. And we'd beat on bags and bricks and rocks and things like that to desynthesize, to toughen up our skin. See? It took, it took some punishment to do that. Well, that's going to do the same thing spiritually. You're going to have to go through some fires and some trials and some hard places for God to be able to burn away some of the dross in your life. For God to be able to humble you like He wants you humble. For you to get that meekness that Messiah had. For you to be able to, 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 to communicate, to have that compassion that God has for the hurting and the sick. You know, if you've never been sick a day in your life, it's hard for you to comprehend to relate to somebody who is sick. But if you've been there, bless God. If you've been there, it's a different story. So when you start praying in tongues, you're praying according to the perfect will of God. And that's not just for other people. So you very well could be praying without your knowledge, God, take me out in the middle of the desert. <laughs> Use that as an excuse to quit praying in tongues. <laughs> so we see that the first Adam lost out because he did not obey the word of God. He was seeking his own independence from the word. The enemy came and told him, you'll be a god. That's why the Lord don't want you to eat of that tree because you'll become a god. Yourself. So he was seeking a godship, so to speak apart from God's Word and apart from God Himself. Uh, the second Adam was Jesus. The Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. And He was made a life-giving Spirit. Life-giving Spirit who yielded Himself completely and totally to be led by the Holy Spirit in everything He did. Now let's read a few scriptures along these lines. 1 Corinthians 15 <clears throat> Verse 22 and 45. and 22 it says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now verse 45 says, And so it is written, The first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Hallelujah. Now turn back to John chapter 5. And you 
see here that Jesus was completely and totally yielded. He was totally reliant upon the Holy Spirit to accomplish the will of God in his life while he was on the planet Earth. And in verse 19 in John, the fifth chapter, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Pretty plain, isn't it? But what he saith the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now, let's read verses 30 through 38. I can of my own self do nothing. Here he is repeating himself. See, he keeps saying this. As I hear, as I hear, I judge. So do I. How did he hear? The Holy Spirit spoke to him, just like he speaks to us. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man. These things I say that ye might be saved. He, John, was a burning and a shining light. And you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Now, Lastly, let's look at, look at Luke 6, verse 38. He said, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that hath sent me. So we see that Jesus was completely given over to accomplishing the will of God, and he had knowledge. He was completely aware of the fact that he did not have the power within himself to accomplish God's will. And so he was reliant upon the power of the anointing that God had placed upon him as he said in Luke 4.18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he's anointed me to do thus and so and this day, this scripture is fulfilled. In other words, this day, hallelujah, I've got the anointing to do what God told me to do. Amen. So in Luke 4, verse 14, we see that although Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God, we see that when he came out of the wilderness, he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. Amen. And he lost out into his public ministry. Hallelujah. And as I said, confessed that he had been anointed of God. Thus all of his actions, words, all of his deeds, we see that the Holy Spirit was acting upon the, still acting upon the prophetical word of God because it had been prophesied that this was how it would be. And I showed you from Isaiah and what have you. Isaiah 61. Now, all actions and reactions of Jesus were significant actions backed up by the Holy Spirit, fulfilling the before ascribed word of God, or as I said, the prophetical utterances of the prophets concerning the coming Messiah. Thus we find the following scriptures concerning the work of the Holy Spirit in the life and in the ministry of Jesus the Christ. In Luke 1, verse 35, once again, we see that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the power of the highest. Secondly, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus was anointed by and filled by the Holy Spirit for a life of service and power, Acts 10.38. 
Matthew 3, verse 16. And turn with me. You already, should already be in the book of John. Let's just back up to the first chapter. I want to show you this. This was the testimony of John the Baptist. In verse 32, now this, uh, remember in Matthew 3, 16, uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in the form of a dove. It lit upon him. Okay? And this was the testimony of John. Now, in verse 32 and 33, John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Now, what does the word abode mean? It took up dwelling. It stayed. And he went on in verse 33 and said, I knew him not. No, I didn't know who he was going to be. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So it's important for you to see that he was anointed. And that anointing came upon him for the work of ministry. And it remained upon him throughout the entirety of his earthly ministry. Okay? Matter of fact, over a couple of chapters over in John, the Bible says him that is sent by God, he that speaks the word of God, to him God giveth the spirit not by measure. So Jesus was anointed and filled without measure by the Holy Ghost for service. Now, Jesus offered himself up unto God through a total reliance upon the Holy Spirit of God to raise him from the dead. He was staking his life on it. Think about it. He was staking your salvation on it. Complete reliance. Now, uh, Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, who's that? That's the Holy Spirit. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So it was through reliance upon the Holy Spirit to raise him from the dead that he offered his body up. That willing sacrifice. Lastly, we see that Jesus was justified in the spirit before God and angels alike. 1 Timothy chapter 3 <clears throat> and verse 16. I love this. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who was that? Jesus justified in the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. He was declared to be just or innocent by the Spirit of God. In that, that Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. Glory. You see, death had no right to take him. He was innocent. And the Holy Spirit justified his innocence, stating he is innocent. He is just. He is not guilty. The entire life and ministry of Jesus was a complete, continuous act of yielding himself to and being obedient to and relying upon working of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the will of Almighty God in his life. If Jesus as God's Messiah had to rely upon the work and the anointing and the infilling of the Holy Ghost to do the work of God, what makes us think we'll do it any other way? We won't, church. We just won't do it. Programs are good in their place but they haven't gotten the job done. We need the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit more now than any generation that has ever gone before us because Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. And there's still a lot of work yet to be done. Hallelujah. So in the closing,
chapters of John. In John chapter 20, verse 21, the Lord Jesus said, Even as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. God sent Jesus anointed, anointed with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was sent to have a Holy Spirit power ministry. He said, that's how God sent me. I'm going to send you the same way. Go and do thou likewise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And that's where we're going to stop. Our next lesson, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit in the church. Are there any questions on anything that I covered during this session? We don't want anybody to have any confusion in their mind because that gives place.